Hello traders, it's Thursday, July the 27th. This is John Kicklider, Chief Strategist for DailyFX.com. Here to give you your market wrap-up for this past 24 hours of trade, and more importantly, an outlook for what we can expect in the next 24 to 48 hours to complete this week. Well, top event risk over the past 24 hours was clearly the FOMC rate decision, and ultimately it would move the markets very significantly, at least in the context of the inactivity we're getting broadly across the financial system, uh, but I would urge urge skepticism about how how long this run is going to get and uh, become off the back of the FOMC rate decision. We'll talk about why. Uh, but taking first a quick look at the dollar, you can see on a daily basis that this did extend the decline for the greenback down to the previous low that we had in June, late June, so 13 month low. Uh, it's, been, it's been this low for a few days now, but uh, we are still in context of the bigger picture uh, 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 above the zone support that we have on this benchmark for the greenback. And that reflects the same kind of mentality that we would get w with something like uh, the Euro USD. We are still at the upper end of the threshold uh, on this particular big picture two and a half year range, though at the very upper end. All right. At 117.41 at the uh, recording of this video, uh, we are at the 38.2 fib of this pre and post massive move from the Euro USD, which is heavily centered upon monetary policy. So very appropriate that we are heading into a technical uh, figure that is derived uh, through the impl Im implementation of this big picture fundamental theme. Now, pressure on this upper threshold should not be seen as an imminent possible break. And if it does break, do not presume that liquidity or sorry, uh, momentum is going to immediately follow through. This is a very difficult drive to sustain. It needs fundamental motivation. And while it might crawl higher, I would expect a lot more of this kind of progress, uh, chop, correction, interspersed with uh, a few productive days and then once again getting back into chop rather than consistency and that makes for difficult trading and a uh, a threat of reversal rather than uh, an actual new trend or a trend that uh, a momentum or a trend trader could could play now other dollar based majors Aussie USD uh, pressuring a new two and a half year high too. Uh, again, this is already having cleared its uh, broad technical uh, breach zone, uh, this uh, 78.50 level that we had. Uh, it is now trying to reach and test how much conviction it can actually muster. Uh, this is a really good uh, currency pair to really test this view. Kiwi USD, All right, that too is moving on to very significant technical levels. We are overtaking this swing high that we had back in September 2016, uh, and now we are moving on to here, a two plus year high, uh, looking much like the Aussie USD, just not with the horizontal resistance that we've broken through. Uh, and this is passing now the midpoint of this past multi year range. All right, again, technical influence, very big technical appeal but dubious uh, backdrop. And I know I put a lot of emphasis on the, the combination of technicals and fundamentals, and in this environment where it seems that uh, risks, as prominent as they might seem, seem to be constantly ignored, that maybe we should just throw in the towel and stop evaluating broadly or conservatively or uh, with a mind to balance. Uh, but I think that <laughs> and I, it's not just that I think I've experienced in the past uh, that when you finally do capitulate and throw in and uh, throw to the wayside the risk evaluation of the component, uh, that's when the disaster comes in. All right, strategy is there for a reason. Uh, good analysis and evaluation is there for a reason. Always seeking out higher probability scenarios rather than just throwing in with the speculative rank that seems to not be following uh, any... Uh, set course and uh, well-defined rules. But Kiwi USD uh, marked a continuation. Dollar CAD has also marked a continuation. Uh, this being, uh, in my book, the most impressive of the ranges. Uh, you can see that we have crossed also a 
collection of very meaningful Fibonacci's uh, on very prominent ranges. Weekly chart for the dollar CAD. All right. So the technicals are prolific. Uh, they look very, very uh, appealing, especially in what is essentially a drought when we look at measures of volatility like the VIX, which we'll come back to, uh, where everything seems otherwise restrained, quiet, and uh, for most intents and purposes, untradeable. We see something like, let's say, the dollar CAD, and it looks like uh, an oasis. It, it's, it's relief for the trader that uh, has struggled to find something that looks like a really good trade. Uh, but I don't want to dissuade from taking trades, uh, but I do want uh, us to all think critically about what we should be looking for. I think it's still very appropriate to uh, approach the market with a short-term mentality, a, a measured risk mentality, take advantage of, of these kind of developments as they arise, but Think in the terms of how to best protect yourself, um, knowing that there isn't a lot of very tangible uh, traction to, to be found, uh, a foothold or a foundation to build a new trend upon, especially an anti-dollar trend. And we could take advantage of the momentum, even if it's just speculatively based, but at the sign that things are starting to fall apart on the speculative or momentum-based front, it's probably better time to, to book profit and wait for reconfirmation or reaffirmation that uh, the trend can continue. Be, be dynamic. Be uh, active in your trading. Don't, uh, uh, don't fall back on a, a buy and hold mentality at the moment. All right. So what was motivating the dollar to its next leg lower? Well, the FOMC rate decision was our top piece of event risk this past session. There is little doubt about that. Uh, but did it really have the kind of influence to continue to drive the dollar lower? No. Um, if you looked at the actual rate decision, which I covered live, and I know a number of you joined me, uh, it didn't really come out with any substantive downgrade in rate forecast. In fact, uh, meeting expectations of no change. The statement uh, essentially kept the language related to future rate hikes uh, r virtually unchanged as well. So the probability of a, uh, of a one more rate hike in 2017, which they had forecasted at their last meeting with the Summary of Economic Projections, still is in place. But so too is the market skepticism. Uh, the probability of a, another rate hike by the end of the year, according to Fed Funds Futures, is essentially 50-50. And we still are at that 50-50 threshold. It doesn't change after this rate decision and the modest changes in, in rhetoric from the policy statement. Also in, uh, referenced in there is the language related to the balance sheet adjustment. Now, it didn't explicitly suggest that September was the go time, but they said it was relatively soon, essentially a reiteration of what they had said at the last rate decision and when they were referencing a very explicit program uh, that they intended to implement when the time was right. Uh, I still think that this is probably a 50-50 chance. I don't change my probabilities on this. There's not a really good way of assessing what the market's pricing in for this time frame, although I've seen uh, individual banks and, and, and analyst groups uh, forecast anything between uh, the next meeting, which is September, all the way out to the middle of next year. Some that don't think it'll actually be implemented. It's just a program that's going to be held on to until something falls apart. But I do think that everything else being equal, September is probably the time frame for this balance sheet adjustment, and when they do get to it, a balance sheet adjustment, it will specifically highlight a further difference in the Fed's policy bearings versus the others. And while other central banks like the RBA and the RBNZ, where speculation still continues to build up that they they are going to hike rates in the foreseeable future and revive some of their lost carry trade appeal, that is still not going to be enough necessarily to catch up to the Fed's moves, uh, which are uh, more significant at that point, to start to reduce some of its extreme exposure. So working down that balance sheet. All right. Now that's going to be an interesting consideration. Uh, what happens if the RBA hikes and the Fed, let's say, reduces its uh, balance sheet, starts its re uh, balance sheet reduction program? Uh, it really depends on the context of market conditions. If risk trends are still riding high, uh, then it's probably going to go to the Australian dollar. So uh, those 
those Aussie based crosses like Aussie USD and the Kiwi based crosses for the same reason like the Kiwi USD are actually attractive uh, from the medium to long term if we follow this course to its full fruition. And they are still, and you look at it in a weekly chart, the Kiwi dollar, Aussie US dollar, there's still a discount. So good potential here, but it does uh, it does require uh, the RBA and the RBNZ to live up to the market's expectations, and it does require, very important here, uh, no significant risk aversion. Because if it does, uh, the nascent carry appetite that is starting to pick up behind this laggard as a risk me measure, and remember, uh, we look at a number of risk-based assets, uh, and carry trade, which is the orange here, has certainly been lagging uh, when it comes to riding high on the risk on environment, uh, which does not put it in a particularly appealing position if risk aversion were to kick in. All right, but it's this context that we need to consider with the Fed's uh, threat or promise of moving towards a balance sheet adjustment program. All right, that can really draw greater contrast uh, and it can ultimately help to lift the dollar, particularly against the likes of the euro, which is still uh, essentially very buoyant because of anticipation that the ECB is simply going to stop their uh, accommodative efforts, I meaning they're going to stop QE and they're going to start plotting out a rate hike. Uh, still a little ways off, and this is very early speculation. Uh, to be made, uh, I mean, to be clear, uh, this is the same thing that happened to the dollar in 2014 uh, when it started to rally well in advance of the Fed's first rate hike in December 2015. Uh, let's take a look at that uh, as a reminder. All right, big rally from the dollar well in advance of the actual rate hike, which uh, started right here because we were anticipating it. Speculative interests were turning forward and they were providing a premium or a value to the dollar, trying to get ahead of that uh, capital inflow. The same thing is happening now to the Euro USD. But if the Fed does something like start to reduce its balance sheet, it certainly cuts down some of the early mover appeal of the Euro because it suggests that the premium that we're starting to attribute or the discount off the euro uh, is uh, moving a little bit too ambitiously, too early. And the equilibrium is uh, could be very uh, significantly lower. All right, so the FOMSI rate decision was essentially just a, uh, a waylay, a, a, a temporary uh, distraction from the existing trend. But the technical levels still are very prominent and they're still in play. Uh, uh, also, the anti-dollar drive, uh, which is more reflective of a uh, just a general rise in appetite for certain currencies like the euro, like the Aussie, like the Kiwi and the CAD uh, for carry purposes and for the ECB's early adoption or early speculation of a future adoption of, uh, of a tightening policy re reversal. Um, these are not fundamental teams that have significantly altered, and they have been building up a lot of speculative premium. So to keep it going, we need more uh, conviction. I don't know if that necessarily comes uh, after the FOMC rate decision. It just kind of temporarily distracted us. And I don't think that there is much in the way of event risk over the immediate future uh, that is going to redefine the policy bearings. Although there's a lot on the docket, which we'll cover some of it uh, a little bit later, but uh, none of this really speaks to a definitive change in the ECB's timetables, nor the Fed's timetables. All right, so it, we have a clear conflict. Fundamentally, this looks like it's overdone and it's stretched. Uh, technically, it's uh, pressuring the upper end of a threshold, and if it breaks, like the Aussie and the Kiwi did, the presumption is that you have breakout that clears and subsequently uh, transitions into an opportunity for momentum. But momentum in a conditional analysis is not very conducive across the entire financial system because we don't have clear, unadulterated uh, value shifting. So cater to your, your risk profile. If you are uh, certainly, a, if you are a trader that uh, looks for uh, riskier trades and you're very flexible and you're moving on a shorter duration, uh, if there is a break here, it might be an opportunity. If you're a conservative trader, I'd say wait until you actually find something that can fuel conviction that this is a trend that can uh, have at least some follow through.
some some meaningful follow through. But it wasn't just about the Fed this past uh, policy, uh, this past session, uh, and what it, it does to the dollar and the global spectrum of monetary policy. Uh, it was also about a focus on risk trends. And before I actually go to the S and P 500, we've talked extensively about the connection of monetary policy, global monetary policy, and what it can do and what it has done to speculative appetite. It has driven volatility lower, and it has in turn motivated capital back into uh, risky uh, assets. And in fact. It's uh, kind of forcing it into risky assets and adding pressure constantly to it. Uh, how does it force risk on or uh, traders taking on risky assets? Because the side effect of extremely accommodative monetary policy is extremely low returns. So this is the baseline for our returns, and this is something like the S&P 500, which is essentially the cost to get into the market. Your costs are rising, your returns are dropping, so you need to, if you're a money manager or a hedge fund manager, you need to make a significant return to justify your uh, fees to manage these people's money and why they wouldn't just go to a spider ETF or the like. Uh, and to do so, you have to obviously dive into riskier and riskier assets that provide greater and greater yield. But that is a profoundly threatening position to put the financial system in uh, to stretch the terms of valuation to move uh, prices beyond what is a fundamental uh, equilibrium uh, but it is a side effect of aggressive accommodative monetary policy remember this connection because the Fed is starting to take a turn in its efforts and the ECB has started to slowly see the probability that it's going to cut off its QE. Uh, and the Bank of England is uh, loosely talking about rate hikes. The RBA and the RBNZ are presumed to soon be following the Bank of Canada. Policy on a global spectrum is starting to shift. And if this connection between uh, risk trends and monetary policy holds, as it did with the uh, Fed balance sheet, and the S&P 500 uh, during the taper, then it could be a pretty significant shift in sentiment. Now, despite the implications here, uh, risk trends showed little interest in this event. This was a very narrow range day for the S&P 500. In fact, if you look at it on a relative basis, um, this is, let me just confirm, uh, no, this, this is not it, this is it. This is the uh, rate of momentum. So to measure this, uh, I just took a, a popular indicator, the average true range, an activity level, uh, and I took the a shorter time, time frame ATR and divided by a longer time frame ATR. So five day, which is one week, uh, divided by 20 day ATR, which is one month. So the activity of just this past week versus the activity over the past month. And this is where it's at. It is the second lowest that we've seen from this particular indicator uh, in a couple of years. That's extremely, extreme deceleration of conviction. Not what you want to see in a bull trend, or if you're playing a bear trend, not what you want to see in any trend. But it's par for course at this point. We, we expect this uh, drop of conviction, and yet it, some, it oftentimes persists. So you can't take this to mean that it's immediately going to reverse. Uh, I certainly wouldn't consider that. But it does tell us something about conviction and momentum and our confidence of placing a long risk trade and just presuming that it's going to continue to play out. You have to take these trades with a certain degree of recognition that I need to remain flexible because this can change very quickly given the lack of return, the lack of momentum uh, makes it a much greater risk or threat of reversal and thereby loss. All right. Now, really, I mean, this is not just uh, related to the S&P 500. We have the FTSE 100, as you can see, it's kind of been a struggle. Uh, the DAX continues to play out that head and shoulders pattern. Uh, the Nikkei 225 is a consolidation, a nice wedge. Uh, even the 
ASX is carving out the right shoulder of that head and shoulders pattern, continues to do so, and has done so for two months. Uh, we do have greater reach on something like the high yield fixed income ETF, HYG, and the emerging market ETF is still very buoyant, very high, uh, but it too has really lacked for uh, steady follow through. Uh, this is the state of our risk, our risk trends. Stretched and at extraordinarily high levels, but increasingly cast in doubt for conviction. Not ideal, not ideal. Uh, now, further investigating in, in the risk conviction area is VIX. We come back here very frequently. It's extremely low. And the low for the day, the low on the VIX for, uh, throughout the session was actually 8.8, .8, one of the lowest that we've ever seen from this index, and that's saying a lot because we're already extremely low. Uh, it also is below 10 again. Uh, this is now an uh, extraordinarily long period below this threshold. And I believe the count is up now to 15 consecutive days below 10. That's extraordinary. All right. Now, what's remarkable is that not only is this extremely low, but it never really had an ambition to pick up, despite the fact that FOMC was on the docket. And to be, to be clear, uh, we also have, uh, through the foreseeable future, uh, the U.S. GDP figure, amongst other event risk, and this is the one-week forward-looking volatility index from the CBOE, extremely low, extremely low. All right, so really uh, indicative of a lack of drive. All right, so what is driving our markets? Well, going back to the S&P 500, and this is also uh, something that can impact the dollar, uh, Confidence has been strong in the U.S. economy, and we saw that yesterday with the consumer, confi uh, conference, or sorry, consumer uh, confidence figures from the conference board, uh, but we're also starting to see some polls increasingly and, and uh, analytical takes that suggest that while confidence in the economy is still robust, confidence in the Trump administration policies, including tax reform and infrastructure spending, which have been very important uh, for this, uh, this rally, especially from November. Recently, in fact, we've actually seen Moody's uh, come out with a update just this past session to suggest that the confidence in the infrastructure spending program in particular had significantly started to drop off in their analysis, which is also the reasoning why the IMF had downgraded the United States growth forecast. Uh, we have also been seeing a uh, number of polls, uh, uh, popular uh, media polls uh, uh, ranging from the political spectrum, that confidence in the uh, performance of the president and his administration's programs are starting to drop off for the economy. All right. Add to that uh, evidence that we're starting to see tension and pressure and concern related to the debt ceiling standoff, and this is a pretty comprehensive uncertainty uh, that we have for the markets. All right. Again, it hasn't actually turned the market, just like uh, monetary policy re recognition hasn't turned the market, but this is another thing that erodes the foundation that is behind uh, these markets' performance. So be mindful of what this represents. Moving away from the U.S. dollar and U.S. Uh, economic backdrop, uh, we do have uh, we did have a lot of uh, scheduled event risk this past session. Uh, not all of it particularly uh, market moving, uh, but it did hold considerable potential. The Aussie CPI figures that we had uh, early in the morning on Wednesday session uh, that was actually a downgrade in inflation expectations or inflation reading. Uh, second quarter uh, CPI actually dropped to 1.9 percent uh, pace on a headline basis basis versus the 2.2 expected, a, a slight ex expected t tick up. It was actually a down uh, down or decline. Uh, that doesn't, uh, doesn't support too much the rate expectations for the R, uh, for the RBA, and you can see that uh, certainly had an impact on a competitive uh, currency like uh, Aussie Kiwi, and it uh, also had an uh, impact on the Aussie CAD, but that did rise. The Canadian dollar uh, had its own uh, issues this past session. But uh, it certainly hasn't put off anticipation of the RBA eventually tightening and eventually drawing back a carry appetite uh, enough to put off what has been a very remarkable reversal for the uh, Aussie USD on a weekly basis. All right. Another uh, noteworthy event risk that uh, had a disappointing outcome, uh, but not the commensurate uh, move in the 
currency uh, was the UK GDP. It was a disappointment, uh, uh, what has been quoted as, an, as a notable slowdown, with a 0.3% GDP reading. Uh, not terrible, uh, but certainly in the context of everyone looking to see any kind of impact on Brexit, it certainly was noted. Cable is now at the 38.2 fib of the post-Brexit range. So the high was back here uh, just north of uh, 150. The low was uh, the post-flash uh, crash uh, low uh, in one, uh, just uh, above 119. And right there at the 38.2 fib, uh, we currently find ourselves. All right. Again, not, this is not a technical uh, development that I would really think has great trade potential because I don't think a breakout will naturally uh, lead to follow through. These aren't those kind of markets. You get a lot more false breaks or breaks that uh, just end with no momentum at all. Uh, that's more the common outcome here. So. Measure expectations uh, commensurately. The euro pound, as you can see, did not have much in the way of traction. I've been watching some other uh, crosses, pound kiwi, as I mentioned before, and the pound yen, uh, but neither of them were uh, giving any kind of clear uh, trade opportunities uh, in the immediate, uh, or at least uh, uh, the immediate uh, trade environment. Now, not really one that uh, I would... Uh, advocate too much trading on because it's uh, extremely volatile and not really the same uh, as an emerging market currency. Uh, the Brazilian real, it was just a good fundamental contrast because this past session, the Central Bank of Brazil uh, announced its rate decision as well. In contrast to the FOMC, which held uh, at a very low range of 1 to 1.25, they actually cut rates 100 basis points, or 1%, down to 9.25. That's pretty remarkable. Again, not the same apples to apples comparison for a currency response for the USD BRL. Now ahead, we need to be very mindful about uh, what to look for uh, and what to follow. I am eyeing with considerable skepticism uh, moves like the S&P 500. Conviction is very difficult to get behind when you get uh, when you start to recognize the erosion of the Trump boom fundamental backdrop is very difficult to also get behind an anti-dollar drive uh, that doesn't really have much in the way of uh, fundamental drive. Uh, where's the conviction to devalue the dollar? Yes, uh, the uh, likes of the euro are doing better. There's no doubt about that in the context of the relative value, but you're not getting that consistency. All right? And I need momentum if I'm really going to be convinced in this. So I'm going to be watching these very closely. There, there are certainly trade opportunities that arise if you do have a very clear and consistent technical level uh, such that everyone is aware of it, which the Euro USD at these heights, that's, that's very likely to be a technical level that everyone's aware of. It could have the speculative influence that people having placed uh, entry orders or the short side traders having placed stops above those levels. Uh, you can clear through some of that, get some follow through, but it's going to be a short term play. It's not a, f uh, a trend uh, development that I'd be confident in. All right, so I'll be watching this. I'll be watching, obviously, with a, con uh, a constant interest, the VIX being at such extraordinarily low levels. And if this reverses, then it's going to mean a lot for uh, the backdrop of other risk-oriented assets. Uh, in terms of event risk, the docket's actually quite dense, uh, but measure expectations. The U.S. docket has a ton of event risk on it, but we will be operating with the knowledge that come Friday there's the US GDP figures, which will override much of what this uh, really entails. I will be watching, however, uh, the Senate hearing for one of the Trump uh, Fed nominees, Quarles, uh, see exactly what the intentions are here, hawkish to dovish, uh, that this potential FOMC board member uh, would bring to rate decisions into the future. I would also point out that earnings season is going to get a boost, Intel and Amazon, uh, two high-level tech companies, although Facebook uh, this past session did have good, uh, generally good figures, uh, at least how they've been assessed recently. Uh, so did Google, but neither of those two companies had a particularly good immediate reaction uh, from their share prices and after hours and subsequent follow-through trade. So 
keep an eye on this. If the tech sector starts to falter, uh, it's going to probably uh, pose a significant risk question for the entire financial system because it's been the leader of essentially uh, the leader in uh, general uh, markets. So in other words, when we look at something like the performance of various risk-oriented assets, the S&P 500 or U.S.-based equities have been the champion and the leader of U.S. equities has been tech shares. So something like the NASDAQ composite, and I've been showing you the FANG as well, uh, the conglomerate of the largest uh, market cap tech sh share stocks. So keep an eye on that. It, we're just keeping uh, constant vigilance on some of these uh, areas of the market that can prove to be profound catalysts for a stretched sentiment. I'd also point out that uh, we do have a, a considerable amount of event risk into the Thursday evening, Friday morning session for Japan. Uh, Japanese in, in, infl inflation and, and employment, noteworthy economic indicator is very important, but the BOJ summary of opinions is going to be particularly interesting. We want to see what the Bank of Japan uh, has uh, or really has been seeing for conviction uh, with their otherwise difficult to read views on monetary policy into the future. They've been very reticent to say anything about changing their ac aggressive accommodation and it's increasingly clear that they're really the holdout, the, the, the uh, aside kind of central bank uh, that is kind of bucking the trend of rebalancing or normalizing. So I, I think this is going to be very important. And a last look um, commodities for example uh, there has been some firming on both uh, gold and oil but really the outperformer has been copper a uh, massive break and that's what uh, a failed head and shoulders panel looks like when it doesn't go into a reversal mode and is invalidated that happens remember technical patterns don't always have to play out and this is a very good example of when it doesn't uh, but also bitcoin uh, that sharp drop has actually extended uh, into a second day uh, after that uh, very clear uh, wedge uh, break. The same is true with Ethereum, just not as much progress. Uh, this is uh, the increasingly speculative and Wild West kind of trading because of that. Uh, there is not a lot of conviction uh, to be found from these trends, and that is uh, largely due because uh, we are not talking about the avoidance of a hard split or uh, anything along those lines. It's going back and forth in headlines and increasingly the playground of speculators. So expected to trade as if speculators were in charge. All right, we'll wrap it up here. We'll do our next rundown of these markets tomorrow. Until then, I wish you good luck trading out there.